It's good to have you back. Uh, it's good to be here, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. I was thinking about, you know, how good it is to be able to do part twos with people, you know, because um, I was remembering some of the things we talked about. You're going to laugh when I say this, but we talked about Starbuck. Right. You got a good uh, memory. You got a the good the memory. Hendrix Joplin Cham uh, Chambers Brothers show. That was good. I wrote these yeah. things down just now. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> Brooklyn Art School, you lasted, I think you said, one semester, and then you split and moved to Boston. Uh, yeah, Pratt and you, Institute, yeah. And you ended up with uh, Willie, uh, not Willie, uh, Velvet Underground's manager. That's right. Yeah. And you know what? We're going to go back and look at some of that. But first, I saw you play with the Nervous Eaters at the Rat Reunion show. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because I was there all day long and I had a really good time. I saw a lot of cool people. And what was your impression of the whole thing? I was pretty, I, I, I thought it was nice. You know, I thought it was good. I wasn't really sure what, you know, who was going to show for the thing, but everybody seemed nice. Everybody seemed into it. Um, you know, they were, people stayed you know, which is a lot of times, you know, tree goes on and everybody leaves and, you know, and uh, so th it was a good experience. It was a nice experience to play. I thought, you know, I thought all the bands sounded good. Um, it was great to hang out with the Dogmatics. It was, it was wonderful. Um, they were great guys, you know, they I mean, I kind of knew they would be, but they were, they, you know, they were just very, um open and friendly and um it was nice to nice to get to know them a little bit i thought the honestly i understand why they would have the nervous eaters headline and so on down but i would have put tree on last <laughs> and i yeah. would have i would have worked my way up to that because i i didn't i wasn't worried about the dogmatics following them up because they're great i mean every yeah, time i've yeah. ever seen since they got back together they're like <clears throat> They were good back in the old days, but now they're smoking, man. Yes. They yes. smoked that day. But I think it would have been better to put the heavier band at the end. Um, Nervous Eaters. Uh, now, I have to ask you this because I was curious. Are you the one that recruited Carissa Johnson to come into the band? Because I have a feeling that yeah. I might be right about that. Yeah, you're right about that. What made you think of Carissa to come in? Besides well, the you know, we reason. had to, well, we well, pretty much the obvious reason. I mean, we 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 knew that things were going to come to a close with Brad. We knew we were going to need somebody. Um, you know, I I basically just went through my mental checklist of like who's out there that you would want to play bass with, and she was just like number one. There was just no. You know, it was like if Carissa wanted, and we had some some stuff with Carissa. The, the she had helped with some booking stuff and some graphic stuff, and our our guy who was booking us was sort of talking to Carissa, and, and I've been friends with Carissa for for quite a few years, so it wasn't like a, a, a you know an incredibly insane thought. It was like I wonder if this person would want to do this. And so I call, you know, I did, I, I guess I did call, you know, get in touch with her and say, you know, would you be interested? And she was like, yeah. So as soon as she said, yeah, to me, it seemed like, well, we have to make this happen because this would be, you know, this would be uh, interesting. You know, it would, it would be newsworthy, whatever, you know, Car Carissa, John, you know, half our age and female and, nervous eaters and you know just the history and everything and it just seemed like if we could make this happen this would be great it was interesting because both the dogmatics and the nervous eaters both injected youth into their band because <laughs> james yeah. young joined the dogmatics and he helped i mean his background vocals alone just helped help them out help jerry out a lot and carissa right bringing her into the nervous eaters immediately made a lot of people interested that were maybe weren't or maybe more interested. And yeah. Now, did, did she take vocal lessons with you? Is that how you knew her? Carissa? No, I knew her through, um, it was through, uh, Linnea Herzog and, and, uh, the power slut people. And she was hanging out with those people. And then she became friends with, 
uh, someone who was a, a roommate of mine, Tracy Chevrolet, was a roommate for a while, and and uh, and Carissa was just hanging out. And we had house concerts at my house, and Carissa played a couple of those house concerts. So that was that you know that was meeting her in a musical context. She's a prolific songwriter in her own right, and in whatever she seems to do. Why do you think it hasn't gone further for her? Just from for a, Carissa. Yeah. Is it just the state uh, of the times, maybe? or I, I mean, I think it's got to do with that. Um, you know, she had some very visible success. I mean, she's just a major talent, you know, and she should be, she should be famous. Um, That's what I'm saying. She, well, you <laughs> know, she won the, the, she and her band won the Rock and Roll Rumble years mm -hmm. ago. And that's always been kind of a blessing slash curse to win that because, you know, a lot of the bands, if you look back historically at the different years that bands won, a lot of those bands, some of them you wouldn't even remember. You just wouldn't remember them, but they won the, you know, the BCN rock and roll, you know. And so uh, this was, you know, this was the, the, new, the new version of the rock and roll rumble. It was at once. Um, she was, you know, the band was stunningly good, and she in particular was. Um, and then what do you do? How do you follow that act? And what she chose to do in fairly short order is go to New York, which seemed like a bright thing to do. You know, it seemed like, okay, that's what you do. You get out of town and you go spread the word and you go to New York, you know, where, and, and it's, and again, you know, this is just, bullshit this is just my take on it but i think that new york um did not open its arms uh mm. to carissa johnson and i think she had a very i mean she and she's still down there and i i uh you know i wish her so well but I, it doesn't seem from from my vantage point like she's had much support in new york um and you know your question i i don't have an answer for you i mean i know there are so many people i mean maybe not that many but there is a list of people that i would say why is this person not famous oh yeah, oh, yeah. and then i would say why is this person you know get eight thousand hits on uh when they put up a picture of their nose on on <laughs> facebook you know why what is it about them that has allowed them to gather this many people that that are attracted to what they're doing and i i you know it's it's pretty incomprehensible how that works and with carissa johnson as an example how do you how could how do you i mean how, you can't make logic out of that yeah, I think she's, she's a. She's, I think she's a star myself. Uh, you, you, for yeah. people out there listening that are not from the Boston area, the the Rock and Roll Rumble. You may have heard of it. It's a yearly event that's been going on forever. BCN used to run it. They folded, and then other people took it over. Um, the most famous band that I can think that went the farthest from the Rumble is Till Tuesday. That's right. Yeah. And then there, there are others, the high beams. Do you remember the high beams? Yeah, I do. I do. You actually do. All I right. Do. Well, you're, yeah, then you're, you're, you're amazing. And heretics or something like that. Yeah, one. I, remember I mean, them you know, too. I mean, all good bands. I'm not saying there weren't good bands, but they're bands that didn't fly out of here to major label deals and opening for bad bunny and whatever, you know, they're just not, it, they're, they're not doing that. You know, yeah, and, I mean, I and, remember and a band called Childhood won the Rumble one year. Childhood, that, and they I, were a good band. They I was were, living, I think I was living in L.A. I remember hearing that. I'm like, who in the world are they? And then I found out they were a Worcester band. They're really well known and legendary in Worcester. Uh huh. Uh -huh. No, <laughs> but, they were a good. They were a good band. They were a a, a, a band that, um, you know, I, I think I saw them at the Inn Square or someplace, or maybe twice. And I and they were different. They were a little bit different. They had a kind of a different thing going on, and they were good. They but were to your point, good. there are a lot of bands that were in the Rumble that completely vanished after the well, yeah. that won the Rumble, I should say, not in, because there were a lot that were in the Rumble that didn't win that became pretty big. But, you know, like Mission of Burma didn't win the Rumble, you know, and right, they, right. they're like 
they might not be as famous as well you know they might not have sold as many records as till tuesday but they're probably as famous because right. everyone seems to know mission of burma yeah. um people i know in fact one was a judge the night that Carissa Johnson was. I was wasn't living in one. I wasn't living here, but I immediately was like, "Who's that?" And then I started checking her music out, and I was like, "Wow!" Like her song "Congratulations" that she put out last year, mm -hmm. one of the best songs I've heard in yeah. the last like, who knows how many years. She's got a lot of good ones, but that one got stuck in my head. You know, right, right. Um, yeah. You know, the last time we were on, we talked about all the things I mentioned, and we talked about Private Lightning uh, quite a bit, and you told some great stories about the producer and stuff. <laughs> uh, a few people asked me this question. They said, why didn't you ask them more about the souls? So, you know, I'm, I mean, we touched briefly on them, but I wanted, before we get into your soul stuff, I wanted to go back and talk about some of these things. Um, can you talk about that band and how they formed and the members and it seems like you guys came close also to like something happening. Can you yeah. wrap that all up for us? And sure. Us? Well, let's see. I, I, um, the pretty much the last gig that private lightning played, uh, I can't, I, I, I honestly can't tell you where the hell it was someplace in the uh, North or North. Give us a little and, time, uh, this would have been uh like 87 or 88 okay or like okay that. and um the band that was opening that night was a band from lawrence called the meetings and this was carmen demarco johnny delmonico norm hartley and a sax player uh louis i believe his name was and i you know was just in a, kind of one of those frames of mind and i just caught their whole set i just you know i was waiting to go on and i was like ah, you know and watch this band and i thought this is a really good band i don't like the sax player and he was the lead singer too so he was a you know a character a guy that and you and he had everything to do with the impression the band was making and it was like all right you know this guy's got to go but these guys are really pretty good and that was the last gig that private lightning played and I just, that was it, the meetings, end of story. A year later, after I'd taken a year off from, you know, Private Lightning Stop, and I had started to kind of write songs and listen to country music on the AM radio in my Dodge Dart, and I started to think, I got to get into a band. So I got to do, you know, what everybody did in those days. You buy the Boston Phoenix on a Saturday morning and you look in the gig section. There's three pages of gigs and you look for something. And I see this ad for a band in Lawrence. And I go, I just looked at it and I said, oh, that's got to be the meetings. And they're looking for a lead singer, lead singer, guitar player. So I... This is, you know, this is stupid. This is, this is fate. You know, this is what, so I call them up, you know, and it's the meetings that it's not listed in the ad or anything, you know, it's, it's exactly what I thought it was. And I went and auditioned and we hit it off. Um, they were really looking for a singer, guitarist, songwriter. They were looking for a front guy to replace this guy, Louie, who played the sax. Mm -hmm. And they were and they were open to to something different. And they all knew, you know, knew of me from Private Lightning. So it wasn't like a, a totally unknown. Um, and I just hit it off with them. And I thought, this is cool. You know, I'll do let's do this. Let's were you do guys this. around the same age, too? Uh, yeah, pretty much exactly the same age. Before you continue the story, I got to ask you about something. You mentioned you had a Dodge Dart. I did. Which the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because you mentioned the Dodge Dart the first time, but you compared it to a a cassette recorder that you had. You said it was <laughs> like my, a, to, no to my to my uh, wall and sack tape recorder. Real there you go. Tape recorder. And you said it was strong as a Dodge Dart. Now I can't believe I yeah. remember that, but I do. Yeah, because you didn't say you had a Dodge. Because everything was made out of metal. Everything's made out of metal. There's no plastic involved in this at all. It's just, it's all, it's all going to last. And the, you know, they stopped making Dodge darts because they were so good 
that they didn't die. And so, you know, what Dodge goes, all right, well, well, we, we fucked up. I'm you know, sorry, we had a- man. I, I don't know why, but I thought that was funny <laughs> because you mentioned the Dodge Dart, but I didn't know you had one. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no, so was- you went up, you went up with your Dodge Dart to rehearse. I did, did up to, up from, from Somerville to, uh, to, to Lawrence, uh, quite a few times a week I'd go up. And um, and they were very open to 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 you know me adding songs uh, you know did, adding did my you own have songs. did you bring a bunch of songs with you and say I these brought, are the songs or did they have something in mind or did well you they write? had they they had they had things but I had been writing songs and um, you know so I did come to the table with some stuff um, yeah. So we, I mean, there, and there's not, I mean, the, I guess the rest of the story is. Um, one EP, right? One EP? Uh, two. Two EPs. Yeah. Shoot I for the s- Moon and, and The Light and You. I did hear EP. one because one of them I saw it found in the record stash over at the New Alliance Recording Studio. Oh, I was nice, like, oh nice. Adam Sherman's in this band. And then <laughs> Alvin Long was like, they were great. And that yeah. was after I did the interview and that's when i realized that he wasn't the only one that mentioned the soul soul. someone else did so i had to ask you did you guys come close to a deal we did we did we we were in talks with columbia and we had a uh vice president of a and r uh loving the band oh i got a story i told it i mean this this guy his name was john mervos from Columbia and he was a vice president of A and R and he, you know he was a heavy and he was um I I got uh one of my songs one of the songs that the souls did um entered as a uh, an ASCAP songwriting uh thing you know and it was at spit I believe it I believe it was spit it was on Lansdowne Street and the place was it was afternoon and it was packed and these were there were going to be 10 songs that had been chosen and th- there was a panel of record industry heavies and and Mervos from Columbia was was in that and they what they did was they would play the song so everybody's sitting there and they'd play this audio and the you know people would sit there on the dais and they'd, they'd sit there and look stern and the song would play and then they'd comment on the song this and that so so they're playing a song and then you know your song comes up and it comes on and it's like oh shit you know and it's like eh, it sounds pretty good and it finishes and marbos goes who wrote that song and this place is filled and i kind of go i did you know <laughs> and he goes i want to talk to you when we're on break he says it's from the stage in front of the whole fucking place and wow. so i go okay this is cool so I, you know, of course, I go talk to him. He's from Colombia. He wants to know everything. You know, do you have a manager? Yeah, we have a manager. Okay, well, I got to meet with him. You give me his number. Blah 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 blah. He took us out to dinner in a, in a couple of weeks. Took us out to dinner. Um, went to his show. You know, saw the saw the band play live. And never returned another phone call ever after he saw you play live. Oh, now what, what was the name of the song? Was it on one of your EPs? Because I'm curious. Uh, who's, who said Love Would Be Easy? It actually got nominated as a best song for Boston Music Awards. It was it's a good, it was kind of a country, kind of a, kind of a uh, birdsy, uh, uh, Eagles, Tom Petty type song. I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one that's going to look for that after this. Yeah. It's, <laughs> on, it's, it's, it's on YouTube. It's on, it's the souls are on, you know. You just brought up, you brought something up that that got my mind going. ASCAP. I remember there used to be a lot of BMI and ASCAP for people listening. They're like, uh, uh, they're the song. They're all about you. Register your songs with them. They collect the money for you. They yeah. used to put on events like that all the time. Because when I lived in LA, every Thursday night I would go to ASCAP's Best Kept Secrets showcase uh-huh. six bands would play i saw a ton of great bands here some uh-huh. ended up being huge bands and everyone in the whole la in our community and fans would all be there every thursday night yeah. those 
agencies don't do things like that anymore. They stop <sighs> doing it. It does and, seem like it's 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 different. You know, I mean, everything seems just kind of like there's no energy in 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 the the in the music industry anymore. I mean, it you know, there's a few top stars that are out there filling MGMs, and then there's Spotify giving away your music. You know, I mean, really, that's what we got. Coconut Teaser. I don't know if I mentioned that. That was the name of the venue in L.A. in Hollywood that mm. would have that mm. event. Everyone would be there. I met. It's because I used to go there that I ended up getting a job at AM Records because I met Brian Huttenhauer because he would always be there and our guy. But you you refreshed my mind with that. So they did that in Boston, too. It spit. They probably did it in cities all over the country. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they did. I'm sure now, they this did. Mervos guy, I kind of faintly recognize that name but i'm not i can't associate him with anything you never ever ever heard from him ever again not a, not a thing so that must have really broke kind of that broke was pretty it. it pretty much broke broke the you know broke any spell that we had you know it was like you know i mean there are only so many times that you can play Johnny D's, you know, how many times are you going to do that? And you want to move the thing ahead. You know, you want to, you want to move to the next level. And, um, you don't you, think you, that you do, way anymore though, do you? I, I just, I mean, it's, you can't, how could you, you can't put your one foot in front of the other. If you're thinking, Oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta get a deal. I mean, that was, you know, that was five years of my life with private lightning was we got to get the deal. How many you know, years? We got to get souls? the deal. Seven. Okay. So that's 12 years with two great bands. And well, you did get a deal with, with uh private lightning. We got we got yeah. I mean, I, I'm not really complaining exactly, but you know, did you, you end up getting you, anything out of that deal in terms of monetary value? No, anything, no, nothing. No. Did the band when, make more money when they played? No. Well, I don't I couldn't tell you that. I mean, back in those days there were college gigs and they were always pretty well paying gigs. And so probably when we were on A and M playing college gigs, yeah, we probably got a few bucks more. But it wasn't like it went from, you know, this to that. You know, it wasn't like that at all. And we got I mean it's you, got not to record I on a, you got to record on a Greek island with a famous producer. <laughs> I don't know about Greek, but that was it was the best uh, story that you told. Us. Oh man, yeah, with a crazy, a crazy fuck, yeah. So, so after the Souls, um, I don't know if we talked much about what happened with you after the Souls. Just a refresher course, and then we're going to get into your songwriting. Well, after the Souls, I just said, you know what? I've had it with music. Had it done. I don't want to play Johnny D's ever again. I don't want to see it. I don't want to play any of these places. I don't want to see music. I don't want to hear it. Uh, rock and roll is not something I want to do. And I painted. I went to my other art. love, my, my, other, my other skill, which is visual art. And I got uh, a series of, you know, excellent art studios, which you used to be able to do for very low money, which you cannot do anymore. And uh, I painted and I started a show in Boston galleries and I did that for 10 years. And for 10 years, I listened to jazz while I was painting and was finally turned on to by because I my mind started to go, what about what I was listening to all these horn players, you know, just every, you know, Coltrane and and Wayne Shorter and all this great shit. And um, I said, what about what about, you know, about six seven years into this i said what about jazz vocalists you know and i, I mm. you know I, I started to think well you know who do i know well there's billy holiday you know and i knew nothing so i went to my friends who knew about this shit and it's like where you know where do i look for and they said well you know there's you know there's ella fitzgerald and there's you know and there's this great stuff out there and there's sarah vaughn and uh you know there's there's tony bennett and and Frank Sinatra, and I mean, they're the big guys, but they're also, and then somebody said, well, there's Chet Baker. Well, I was waiting for you to say Chet well, Baker. Well, I, I mean, that, it changed my life because when I heard Chet Baker, I, what, what, I, what I did when I heard Chet Baker was something that I tell my vocal students not to do. I just said, you know what? I want to find out 
and I hadn't been I hadn't been singing or playing or anything for years and years. I want to see if I can sing a song like Chet Baker would sing it. I want to see if I can, you know, because I was thinking what's, you know, a lot of you step away from this stuff and you kind of go, how have you been using your voice? You know, what have you been doing as a musician? You know, is it, is it really you? Is it really, you know, are you showing something of yourself? Are you, are you, um, uh, you know, are you, are you allowing people to see into who you are? And I, I started to think maybe a more laid back, a more, melodic musical way of using my voice would be cool you know would be interesting so i just i just decided fuck it i'm i'm going to try and sing like chet baker i'm going to say and i went out to boston music company which used to be downtown and was a fabulous place you'd walk in and there was nothing but racks and racks and racks of sheet music and music books and i found sheet music from my funny Valentine that was printed in like 1952 or something like that. It was the mo. It was like a piece of history. This beautiful two color printed. It was like blue and red, blue and red. Like that was the colors on the thing. And it was just like okay. And it's and I took it back to my studio, my art studio, and broke out um, my classical guitar with nylon strings on it and started to learn how to play the jazz chords on this sheet music. And then I taught myself to sing it, play the jazz chords, and I started to sing it and I recorded it and I said, this, this I like. So I immediately wrote a song that I could sing um, that would be mine in this sort of smooth, mellow, kind of jazzy thing. So I wrote January, February yeah. and recorded that too. Um, and that led to me sending um my funny valentine my recording of that and january february i sent it to jeff hudson and said would you would you make me a video for 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 one of these songs and he got back to me and he said well he said you know it's good he goes you know sort of the, and, and he said i don't think you want to do funny valentine he goes the other song is pretty good um and i said well you know the other song would be the probably the choice you know january february uh and I said, well, you know, and besides, that's an original. And Jeff goes, wait, you wrote that? And I said, yeah. And he goes, all right, we're doing a video. And we made a beautiful video, which is still on YouTube. Yeah, you know, I saw it. It's, it's, yeah. it's a lovely, a lovely, you know, Jeff is one of the most talented guys. Um, that's Jeff and Jane, Jeff of Jeff and Jeff Jane. And Jane. <laughs> yeah, we just we just went to visit them out in uh, Western Mass. We we hung out with them for a day. It was it was great um, to see Jeff and and to see Jane. And Jane's painting and uh, doing beautiful work. And Jeff is just kind of being Jeff. He's still making videos and and um, being being the artist that he is. Okay, I'm not prying or anything, but did you see anyone else when you're in Western Mass? <laughs> well, you know, Robin Lane is my girlfriend now. She broke and, and, that story on my podcast. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> he, she surprised me, and I was like, wow, what a perfect couple. When I heard that, I was like, oh, man. wow. It's just one of the most amazing, you know, uh, to have something like Robin come into your life at this point um is really uh you know i i just i don't have words for it really i'm happy but, for both of you i really thank, am thank you steve uh you remember i remembered something else that you said that was really really interesting you said when you started giving vocal lessons and this kind of pertains to you going for the Chet Baker. You said you have to find your two-year-old self. I I'm pretty sure you actually said that when yeah, it comes to singing. Like good. you could sing when you were two. Think about your two-year-old self. Well, so, the thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing people, people have, you know, adults, grown-ups have trouble with is letting go, you know, letting the, the actual, you know, loudness of your self come through your body and out your mouth, you know, it's, and so people kind of, ah, they, they hang back. They don't want to do that. And if you recall any two or three year old that you've been around, they make a lot of noise when they want to, you know, when they want to be loud, they are loud. 
you know, I hear I live on Western Avenue in Cambridge. I mean, I hear kids, that, you know, in their strollers all the time. Ah! You know, you're just hearing them. And they are allowing for their full voice to leave them with no breaks. There's just no, I, I hold nothing back. I'm three years old. I'm just going to let this go. And we, as, you know, grownups that want to sing, can kind of try to access some of that joy, that abandon that we had when we were, you know, kids. And we didn't think about, you know, before you got criticized, before you were told you couldn't sing or you, you know, please don't sing in music class. You know, you, you, I mean, all of that stuff inhibits um, entirely. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, you, you, you believe it. You know, you could, you're, you're at a very impressionable place um, when you're young. And if you're told that something that has the potential to make you feel vulnerable um, is bad, the you know our inclination is to to not do that anymore and so it's one of the things and, and you know i mean uh inversely when somebody comes in for a singing lesson and they just sing right out you just you know as a teacher you're very happy right away you're going to do this you know you're going to make this happen because you, you're already doing the most important thing you're just allowing your voice to move through your body, right out your mouth. And, you know, we can see into you because of that. We can see you. And it's, a, you know, it's a wonderful thing. Do, do you get a lot of established people come in and take vocal lessons with you that are already in bands or have records you out know, or anything? Or is it all I newer? Mean, it, I've had some, I've had some people come in from bands, but mostly, I mean, you know, mostly people who are out there doing it you know actually doing it um have to be kind of in a special place where they say what i said all those many years ago which is i want to be the best fucking vocalist i can be so i'm going to go study and i'm not going to assume that i can just roll out of bed and sing great and I learned so much. I learned so much. And my voice is so different now than it was in Private Lightning. It's so completely different. And my, my confidence in what I'm able to do and my knowledge of, you know, where to sing and how to use my voice is, um, is very deep. And it comes from years and years and years of, of paying attention to it. Um, and a lot of people who are in bands, um, they're getting what they need. They, you know, I'm in a band, I get to, I get to gig at the jungle and, um, you know, and, and why would I need to anybody to show me anything, you know, and I think you have to be a person that sort of is open to the idea of learning, you know, getting mm -hmm. learning, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, it, it, it's something that I think when we, we get older, we, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not, this is not a revelation, but I think, you know, the older we get, the less open we tend to be to learning something new. Even, so, young, even some younger musicians are like that. Cause you know, I've worked in management for a long time. It's really hard sometimes <laughs> to tell people to try and do something different when they have it well, worked out already in their own head on what yeah. they want to do. So, yeah. um, you mentioned another thing you mentioned the last time we talked is that you started writing songs when you were nine years old. You know what I was yeah. thinking about when you said that was, are there any songs that you wrote all those years ago that you ever like, do you have a vault? Do you go back? Do you ever remember a song that you wrote when you were a teenager and you try and revisit it? Or are you constantly just working on writing newer material as time goes on? I, I think mostly, I would say I'm, you know, I concentrate on writing newer material. I, I, there are some songs from the earliest days that I remember little bits of, you know, I'll remember a line from a song. What about those um, recordings that you did? Do you still have them? I lost them in that fire. 
Oh yeah. And a fire at the studio. I lost, I mean, I look, you know, what I lost there is I, if I start making a list of it, I get very sad because I'm it, sorry it all, for, went. I apologize for having, no, no, no. remember that. And I, that's I, all right. I know we that's talked okay. about that last time and a lot of people have know about that. Yeah. Um, I was just curious because, uh, you know, you've been writing songs for a long time. Um, okay. This new single that you, put out pure is yours yeah dude that is like the the, the most obvious love song i've heard in a long time that is a yeah. real love song <laughs> i mean a lot, you know i know we don't know each other very well we only talked a few times but you're that you you had to write that on a personal feeling you know i mean it seems yeah. to me that you it's a real love song it's a real love song yeah can you elaborate on it a little bit <laughs> or is it too uh, personal? Well, I mean, I don't know if elaborating is particularly, I mean, uh, you know, lyrically, I just, when I thought of this idea of love being um, singular and love being so specific to someone and I thought, it's pure you know when love is real it's really pure it's just it's so direct it's so real and i think that was kind of what i you know i i think i just thought through like what you know how does this work and so much of the time you know when you fall in love i mean for me so much of the time is is uh the time apart like waiting to see your love again and just that that little line about you know now i hear the knock on the door and and uh i recognize the knock from before you know it's just i like love that, that line to, 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 it's a great thank I you love i mean I, I i love it too you know i'm i'm it's i i don't take too much credit for my songwriting because i feel like the songs like so many artists say, the songs seem to come from elsewhere. They they kind of you you open yourself to them, and then things you know move in, and you you begin to see the the totality. But um, when, when yeah, I heard, yeah. if I can interrupt you for a second, when I heard that line, it reminded me I used to have a girlfriend that I was in love with. She's no longer with us. She passed away, no, and she sorry. used to wear Egyptian musk all the time mm, and right. i remember one time i was walking down my hallway going to my apartment i'm like she's here i can smell the egyptian oh musk. i love it i love it and you know That's the beautiful. other thought i got from that song and it's funny you said love is real i thought of john lennon the song love love is real yeah, yeah. it kind of like it, it's that heavy of a love song and uh, mm -hmm. you know musically i noticed because i went back and checked out river of dreams the 2018 record you kind of have a style going on now where you, you're following this. I mean, how would you describe it? Like they used to call it like, I don't know, adult alternative or. Yeah. I, you know, I, the, the terminology is, is kind of lacking. I mean, the, the, yeah. I mean, adult contemporary. I adult would say. contemporary is what I you meant know, to say. I yeah. mean, yeah, but you know, I still think it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, rock folk you know it's kind of it's and there's a little soul and i don't know you know i mean i don't really know how to characterize it i don't really i've never really been totally comfortable with with someone saying you know how do you characterize your music and then having a, a quick answer um i think it's uh i think i mean i i i think there's an intelligence and a craft um of the song and specifically the lyrics that to me sets it apart from uh songs that are more uh visceral so i think you know it's not punk rock it's not metal it's not really heavy rock but it's still you know i can tap my foot to it and i can sing along to it and parts of this melody get stuck in my brain you know, that I can't let go of. And I think, well, that's, you know, that's music. That's, that's good music. And it, it, 
it, you know, and I appreciate what you're saying too, because I don't really know if there's a thread to what I do, but I listen to some of the stuff that I really care about. And I think, oh yeah, you know, there, you've got things, I've got things that really speak to me. And over the years, they keep surfacing. And, you know, you still, you, there's no doubt that you still can rock because I just watched you a week ago today, I think it was, <laughs> and you're ripping those chords, man. You know, I mean, the Nervous Eaters, it's not like, you know, heavy as it used to be, but it's still rock. It's still garage rock in your yeah. face, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, just for a minute, before we go back to your solo stuff, I meant to ask you this before. I ran into Steve Cataldo before i you guys played and he said that you guys are gonna it was your last gig for a while uh what exactly does that mean i mean are the nervous seat is going to make a new record or i mean is it just a... it's unclear right now i think steve has got some health issues that need to be addressed and it's hard to know it's you know it's steve's band um and um and Steve is a difficult guy, you know, he's, he's, he, he's he got a lot of passion and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of integrity in a lot of ways. He's, you know, so talented as a guitarist, as a singer and a songwriter, you know, so talented, such great songs. And I think he's always, you know, if you look at the history of the Nervous Eaters, he's always kind of you know, subverted success. He's done things that have kind of kept his light from really shining. Um, it kind of goes know, the, back to what we were seeing before about people. You don't know why they never made it big. He's well, a great Steve, example. Steve, Steve is a great example. Yeah. And Steve, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, he has never engaged the public ever, ever, you know, and he, you know, I, I don't, if you look to the left and the right and the people that have been more um, accessible and have done things that have been, you know, remarkable in some way, um, I, you know, I think a lot about uh, a band that I see now that's, that is really doing well uh, is Buffalo Tom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they're really doing well. And I think about like, what's the difference between the way Bill Jonovitz has, has uh, approached his public and you look at the hot stove and all this stuff and he's written and he's, you know, he's out there and he's an interesting character. He puts the band back together and they draw people, you know, and people are coming in to, and they're turned on to this. Now, I don't, you know, I don't really know that much about what they're doing but i i you know if you compare their popularity to the nervous eaters popularity mm. it's just like they're in different camps completely you know nervous eaters are struggling to get people into a room um and buffalo tom is playing big venues theaters you know and uh and you, you know you just have to go all right well you know it it, it it's, it's it's not always fair and it's not always uh equitable in any way and they're having a great run at it and we're not you know so what do you do and then you you know steve says he's he's feeling not so good and needs to kind of pack it in for a while and you can't really argue with that you know right. because it's it's you can't really say hey man we're at the top of our game now i mean we've put out a i think it's a great album i think that's a great album that just came out and it just you know man it just didn't really it, did, it didn't open any doors and um you know we got some air at play on there but but that stuff is is ephemeral it just goes you know it's like you get a, a couple of days of somebody's listening to your stuff and then and then they don't come out to the gig it's a very short attention span that we're dealing with right now. With people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. I mean, it's really hard to keep people's attention. You know, and then, you know, the nervous seaters have managed to do that for a long, long time. They, you know, they, have, they have. Many different lineups, you know. But yeah. I just was curious because uh, he sounded pretty definitive when I asked him 
what was going on. He said, we're not going to be playing again. And I, he didn't really elaborate on it. So I didn't, I doubt he meant it was the last gig the band will ever play, but I, I kind of felt like it was going to be a long vacation. It's um, going to be a long vacation, yeah. Jim. So sorry, I know I'm all over the place. I, I'm, you're, good, I'm you're good. You're I'm good. Famous you're good. for this. So you got pure, <laughs> pure is yours. You pretty pretty much put that out yourself, right? You're not on absolutely a label. no label. Don't it's need on it. Bandcamp. You can get it on Bandcamp, right? And that's where I'm going to put it. And that's what I'm going to do from now on, unless something bites me in the ass. I'm not putting stuff. I'm not doing distro kid. I'm not putting stuff on every streaming platform. You want to hear it? You go to Bandcamp. You want to see the Adam Sherman band? Come on down to the plow. Uh, you got a problem with that? I don't give a shit. And believe Whatever. me, I want to come and see you at the plow, but where I live and the Sunday afternoon. Yeah, don't worry it's about a it. A little don't, difficult. I mean, Are you playing today? No, no, no. Not till the thirteenth. Of October. Okay, do have a good excuse for that one. I'm going to be in California. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Well, in that case, you're spared. Uh, so so do you have a bunch of songs now and you're just going to kind of release singles for a while and then do an album? Is that your plan? Yeah, I'm going to do... Um, well, I'm actually going to do an EP with Ken Field producing. Ken Field produced my 2001 uh, solo CD, the first solo CD, which I still love more than just about anything. There are, there are cuts on that that I just think, okay, that that's what I want to, that's how I want to be remembered, you know, is from that cut. Um, and I just, you know, I've, I've been dealing with some people that I really don't like that have really, uh, you know, screwed me and treated me badly. And I just thought, what, what do I do? And I thought, I go back, to the people I trust, to the people who know me and the people who care about me. And Ken is one of the best musicians I've ever played with. And I have just nothing but respect for Ken musically. And we've, we've been friends for, you know, 50 years. Uh, and I just thought that's what I want to do. Is so he he's so, got- Is he someone yeah. you met when you first moved up here when you were like a late teenager? Yeah, you know what, Ken? Ken and Henley Douglas used to come by the Bun Ratties gigs with the souls, and they'd bring their horns, and they'd wow. just sort of stand by the side of the stage, and we'd go, hey, come on up. <laughs> and they'd come on up, and they'd play on a couple of songs. And, so it and wasn't that's planned? How they would just show up? No, with they'd, sh they'd show they, – they, I mean, I, literally the first time, it's just us looking – you know, playing and looking down and seeing these two guys standing there with their horns. <laughs> You know, in, 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 yeah, yeah. And so they used to come and play with us and they started to show up. You know, they just started to show up at gigs because they knew that they'd get invited up. And I, I, that's how I met Ken was, was doing that. And that's uh, cool. we, be, we, we became friends and his, his late wife, Karen Aqua, uh, and, uh, and myself were, were, um, were very close. And does I he have a studio in the Boston area? Ken is, he's living down a, a lot of the time in Truro now, and we're going to oh. do, we're going to do the recording uh, with John Evans, who plays bass with Tori Amos. Oh. Um, he's got a studio in Orleans, and that's where we'll record. And John Evans, uh, who plays with Tori Amos, is going to play upright bass on the sessions. Wow! And uh, yeah, it should be it should be great. It should be great. And so that's going to be an EP, and that EP will do three songs, and then I'll include pure, pure as yours on that EP, and I'll put that out whenever it's done. February. So March. four song EP. Four song EP. Yeah. Nice. That's a good plan. And yeah. uh, in the meantime, if people want to see you, you've got October 13th at the plow. Are you doing anything else besides we're the doing, residency? We're doing a, a, a Kamala uh, Harris uh, uh, fundraiser at the Crystal Ballroom on the 10th of October. So right before that. Um, and that's going to be me. Well, there are a bunch of good, good performers there, but we'll play. I, I will be part of Robin Lane. Peter Hoffman and myself will do a trio there, and um, and that should be good. That should yeah. Be good. Well, good cause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You well, know where I stand. <laughs> yes, and you know where I stand. And what so. was the date of that again? That's the tenth, uh, Thursday, the tenth at the Crystal Ballroom. I think it's seven o'clock start. Fantastic.
Adam, it's great talking to you, man. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. And I, and you know, everything you told me the last time we talked, it, a lot of it's sunk into me and I remembered it. That, that doesn't always happen because I talked to so many people, but you had some, yeah. it's a good story, man. I hope nothing right. but the best for you. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. Man, I hope nothing but the best for you too. And I, I love your show and, and uh, you know, I don't pay that much attention to this stuff, but Last time you interviewed me, I watched the whole bloody thing on YouTube because I thought, this is pretty interesting. And you know <laughs> what? The audio was pretty good. The audio yeah. was pretty good. What? Yes, that's right. That's right. The audio. It's this microphone right here. It's oh, a, yeah, it's a that's Rockville it. microphone, $109. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, there, there you go. You got to have one of those. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Steve. I'll see you All soon. Right. All right. All right. Take care.